Well, good morning, everybody. Um, actually, I guess good afternoon. It's so civil to start your day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, have a gentle rolling discussion that leads us early into the evening and a nice dinner. Um, and I'm happy about that. Uh, so there we go. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about some rights reserved. I'm going to talk a little bit about CC. I want to talk about suborbital space travel, about collective action, about how everything that we do is political, and the big open, uh, an idea that we've been working on uh, with other partners. So first of all, CC has changed a lot. Um, since you may have first known us, we began in 2001. Uh, and today, we're an organization that works collaboratively with affiliate chapters in over 85 countries around the world. Um, you likely know us for the licenses and these icons that you see over my head and the idea of going from all rights reserved to some rights reserved. Now, CC itself was born out of a movement for what we be believed to be unfair copyright laws. The Copyright Extension Act of 1998 in the United States extending the term of copyright from life plus 50 years to life plus 70 years. Now, I'm a Canadian and so it's still life plus 50 in Canada, but in the US it went to 70 and it went to life plus 70 retroactively, uh, which we felt uh, was particularly unjust uh, since it's hard to incentivize someone to do something that they've already done. Uh, nonetheless, a Supreme Court case followed and we lost that case. Uh, Lawrence Lessig, our founder, lost that case and had agreed with Eldred, the person uh, that he had uh, worked with on that case and who had been in the test case, that's, that he would do something to make something good come from this constraint of copyright, this thing that we all hold and none of us can dispense of unless we have a lawyer. That we would do something that was simple and standard and easy and free. Uh, and there began this idea of the CC license tools. So advocacy has always sat at the center of what we do, even though we are an organization that provides these licenses that have become a standard that many people count on. Advocacy is at the center of the work that CC does all over the world. Now those licenses are the product of a global community. They were originally written first by uh, the CC organization in the United States and then work and then adapted collaboratively for every single country in the world. We called it porting, which is a term we borrowed from video games and software. Um, and we would adapt for the local needs of every country. A number of years ago, through a two-year-long global process, we worked with those communities to build a license, one license to rule them all, so to speak, the 4.0 suite, which is a single license which operates globally that everyone can use. And that was written by, and is maintained uh, by that global community. And it's been used, those licenses, as you saw earlier in the opening presentation, have been used over 1.2 billion times. CC today is more than just licensing. We're a capacity building organization. We are infrastructure for the internet, relied on by many in order to uh, pursue their work, whether it's open access or open education or sharing photos, videos, 3D models, and any number of other things. But every day our work is in service of these community-based teams that we work with to enable them to pursue their own uh, agendas and to be a hand-in-hand -hand collaborator in that work. Uh, so I'm uh, based in Toronto. Our team is based all over the world. And as I mentioned, those chapters are around the world. Just recently, CC has been involved in pushing for education reform with UNESCO at the World Global Congress, which is where I was uh, about a week ago in Slovenia, uh, working on copyright reform in Europe with our partners in Communia, and Mozilla, and Wikimedia, Edri, and others. Um, in the NAFTA negotiations that are ongoing in Canada right now with Canada, the US, and Mexico. Um, and um, supporting local campaigns like the Diego Gomez campaign, a story of a young man who shared a single paper uh, and could face up to eight years in jail for copyright infringement for sharing just a single paper online. So today our major initiatives focus in three areas, the movement, the infrastructure, and education. I want to talk to you a little bit about those so that you have a sense of what we do and maybe find some pathways in to work with us and, and the, uh, our community. Uh, so this is a photo of some folks at UNESCO last week. There was a session organized by Communia and all of these folks presented on the various uh, activities that are ongoing in their own communities. And CC was part of that work. Uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, that was at the UNESCO World Congress working with global leaders to advocate for open education and collaboration and a reform of the models that support the sharing of knowledge around the world. 
This is now at the center of our strategy, enabling local teams to be stronger and to work together, and that's what we do every day. We also know that uh, CC's tools need to evolve over time, and the license is just one piece. We often talk about how the licenses are three parts, uh, the legal code, the what we call human readable deed, um, and the metadata. And we'd like to add a fourth layer to that, which is software, a registry back soft, uh, registry back piece of software that allows us to track all of the available works on the web, their uh, location, and their associated metadata so that we can prov provide tools to the open movement to let them build things to provide utility. Now, the piece we're building right now, we call CC Search, and you can uh, try it at ccsearch.creativecommons.org. Actually, this is the largest screen I've ever had, so for the first time, you can actually read the URL uh, that goes with my presentation. Um, we've indexed about 1% of the commons for this beta, which we launched in February. It's only photos at the beginning. We wanted something people could try and use and give us feedback on. Uh, and so we've released that. We'll be versioning that in November and adding new features and also adding new content. But our goal is to index all 1.2 billion licensed works going on 2 billion or 5 billion over time and make them available uh, through an open API so that we can build services like search, but also so that others can build services to make the commons more usable and discoverable. Lastly, we know that CC can't be the only experts in this. And so one of the things we've been working on is a project we call the CC Certificate. And the idea here is to build a set of open educational resources that anyone can use in their own time. We are literally writing the book on CC, on how we work openly, on how you use our tools, how you apply them, and the challenges and opportunities associated with working in the open. Um, that certificate will be both OER that anybody can use anytime and remix, it'll all be open uh, content, but also an optional certificate for people who need that kind of training or who would benefit from being able to demonstrate that proficiency. And we've heard from, in particular, librarians, educators, and people we work with in government that that's a useful tool for them. And so we'll be launching that at the CC Summit in April of next year. So let's talk a little bit about space travel. This is copyright camp, copy camp. So I want to talk about copyright, and I'm going to start here. Come with me for a minute and, and just imagine something. I want you to imagine that some point in the next 20 years, it will be possible for you to get on a spacecraft and travel around the world in a suborbital space flight. Any destination in the world in 90 minutes. You can go anywhere in the world suborbitally in 90 minutes. Cape Town, Beijing, Toronto, you name it. Now think about how complex the laws will have to be to make this work. Imagine you, uh, the International Space Station circling the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour, thousands of communication satellites, and maybe hundreds or even thousands of flights a day traveling around the world, crisscrossing each other in suborbital space. Think how complex these laws would have to be and the regulations in order to make this safe and efficient. Now imagine if the way that we made those laws come to pass was by taking the existing Road Traffic Act and adding the words, in space. <laughs> this is what we did for copyright in the digital era. We, add, we took the old laws that were written for printed books and we added the words online and digital. And that's worked out just about as well as you would think that that would. So maybe it's impossible to imagine that we could have something better than that. Maybe it's impossible to think that we could untie copyright from this mess of other laws that it's implicated with, where copyright now sits in public processes like the EU copyright reform or the one going on in Canada right now by legislation, but it also sits in the secret trade agreements negotiated alongside the number of suits that are allowed to be imported or how many automobiles uh, can cross from one country to another and gets bound up in these ridiculous negotiations where the majority of the parties who are interested are not ever going to be at the table. The large rights holders get to sit there, but all of you, the small rights holders, us, aren't invited. But I'd like to think that maybe we could have something better that maybe we should allow ourselves to dream bigger and think of the potential of what it would look like if the copyright laws that we had today were actually based on data, were actually based on evidence, the kind of evidence that Reagan talked about. But they're not, are they? We know that publisher rights 
don't help publishers. We've already seen it in Spain. We've already seen it in Germany. We have the data. It didn't work. And yet, here we are, ancillary copyright in the EU copyright reform proposal. Similarly, we know that piracy is massively overstated. But when the report was funded, Julia Retta had to do FOI requests in order to get it pried out of a back cabinet to get it released because it just you know, magically ended up on a shelf when they found out that the impact of piracy is negligible in most cases. Copyright is an exclusive right given to every person who creates, every single one, every one of us, and it's automatic, and it lasts for a very, very long time today. It's supposed to drive innovation and creativity. It belongs in public debates, not in private negotiations. But this is the new normal. And make no mistake, the, the issues that we're dealing with, this is a global fight. And so why do I in Canada, besides the fact that I work for a global organization, care about EU copyright reform? Because whatever happens here is coming to a country near you. Because this is the strategy of the rights holders around the world. It's a ladder effect. They will try for every right that they can land in every jurisdiction that will listen all around the world. They will attack the rights that they don't like and they will advance the rights that they think they can drag over the line and then export them everywhere. We've already seen this with uh, the education exception. So Canada has a broad education exception under fair dealing. And the first thing that happened is as Australia went into copyright reform, the publishers went over and said, well, it's destroyed the industry in Canada and put out a report full of specious lies that said that no one writes books anymore in Canada, which is, I can tell you is not true. Then they came to Europe and did exactly the same thing. And we're seeing this all around the world. So we're defending the Canadian copyright exception in European copyright law negotiations because we know what happens there will come back to Canada because we're reviewing our copyright right now. And so you have copyright review in Argentina, Canada, Australia, South Africa, um, and the United States all going on. But you also have secret agreements. You have NAFTA uh, right now. You have TPP-11 or TPP minus the United States. You have EU Mercosur. You have CETA. And who knows what else because they're secret. And so we have to wait till we find out about them and then hope someone will slip us a copy of a draft because we're not invited into those rooms. You're not invited into those rooms. But it's always the same agenda. It's always extending terms. It's always eroding exceptions. It's always takedowns and filtering to protect old models of industry. And it's always protectionism. And the saddest part about this is these secret agreements live on until they get rewritten. They last forever if they never get changed. They don't move at the speed of the internet. Not, not that copyright does either, but they don't. So a good example, Canada, a late participant in the TPP negotiations, has notice and notice. There's a clause in there that says, it's okay, Canada, you can keep notice and notice as long as you never change your copyright laws. That's written into the agreement. These kinds of terms, what does that term do when Canada tries to do public legislative change with their communities about what is the right copyright law? Oh, by the way, we made this secret agreement we can't tell you about. Sorry, we, if we do this, you lose that. That's what happens when we don't do copyright law in public. Now, our opponents have more money, more influence, more access to the change maker or to the policymakers than we do. On our own, I'll be honest with you, we are not strong enough. We are not well enough funded. We are too few on our own and our voices are not loud enough. But together, we have that opportunity. If we work together, if we don't pick small fights with our friends, if we pick big fights with our enemies, we have those opportunities to make change. CC is doing that work and collaborating with teams all over the world. I mentioned Communia, C4C, Edri, Mozilla, Wikipedia, IFLA, and others, and you, I hope, um, if you're not already involved, will be compelled to join us in that work. Everything is political. This is obviously political work that we are doing. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't note uh, that here in Warsaw was the last time that many Creative Commons members saw Basil Cartabil, a Syrian Creative Commons activist who earlier, um, not, not a month ago we learned, had been murdered by the Syrian government. He was someone who tried to bring the internet and openness to Syria. It was a wonderful, wonderful piece by Alice Sue written in Wired Magazine just yesterday about him and his legacy. 
and here was the last place we saw him, and here we are fighting for copyright still and for the open internet. And I want to remember him and the work that he did. We are, all, we are all very fortunate to work in a place where we're allowed to disagree with our governments, and we're allowed to speak out for openness and collaboration. But copyright reform in Europe was supposed to be this grand opportunity for us to modernize, for us to dream of a better internet. And three years into this grueling process of copyright reform, uh, with you know, these thousands of amendments that are going to be reviewed by five committees and then go forward and then still have to get implemented by member states, it sort of feels like we're still just protecting old business models and worrying about whether or not which policy is going to break the web as we know it. I've heard more than a few suggest that maybe we should just delay this whole process so it can die on the vine with this session of the European Parliament and we can start again and maybe get it right the next time. Still, I, I think there's potential for good outcomes. I think there's still opportunity. There are education exceptions that could be meaningful if they were available to everyone, if they are not restricted by learner or teacher or technology. There is power there and there's meaningful potential. At the beginning, text and data mining, the ability to use powerful computers to review materials like data in order to tease out patterns and learn about the, the content that we have available to us, things that would help us unlock discovery in science and enable new business models, there is potential there, but it can't be limited to scientists alone. It needs to be for everyone. It's a transformative use that will unlock things we will never find otherwise. Freedom of panorama, the most obvious public policy idea I could possibly think of, the most no-brainer, you should be able to take pictures of things in public. The idea that this is illegal is obscene, and in many countries it is. And finally, this, the idea of user-generated content, a law that actually reflects the way humans use the internet and their phones, seems obvious. Um, and there's great potential there if that actually made its way through. We're not without hope. I was doing a little bit of research and I, and I stumbled upon uh, this uh, little piece of research. And so December 28th, 1537, Francis I signed L'Ordonnance de Montpellier into law, uh, which required that every person who wanted to publish a book had to deposit a copy of that book on the best available paper into the Royal Library at Blois. This was legal deposit. It was the beginning of an idea of an education exception because at that time there was obviously no internet. And so the only way that you were going to have access to free knowledge, books you didn't pay for, is you were going to go to a library. That's 170 years before the Statute of Anne codified the idea of copyright. The idea of sharing knowledge, or at least the formal law that required the sharing of knowledge, is 170 years older than the idea of restricting access to knowledge or the idea of protecting copyright for booksellers. But none of these things are certain. We have a long way to go. I spent some time in politics before I ended up at Creative Commons. I was an advisor to the mayor of Toronto, David Miller. And one of our old sayings was that the public or that politicians should find a parade and stand in front of it. We are the ones building the parade. And our opportunity is to make that parade big and loud and boisterous and energetic and compelling so that those who have the opportunity to make decisions can stand in front of it. We have to build that parade and the opportunity is for us. So what can we do? First of all, let's use this time to talk to each other. Let's figure out how we can work together. And I want you to know that I come to this through the lens that this is one global fight. Every country you are from, every place that you are working on this, every issue that is being raised is an issue that, as I said earlier, is coming to a country near you. And so there's an opportunity for us to see the whole board, to work together and to rally our forces to do something together. Because what we win, we could win everywhere, but what we lose will be following us around for decades. Finally, uh, share these conversations. This can't be the end of the conversation. It has to be the beginning. Um, and there are many more coming. So at Wikimania in August, uh, I was there uh, in Montreal, and we talked about what we call the big open, the idea that we are all part of a large open movement. And we disagree on many small things, but we agree on many, many big things. And that this is a conversation that we're going to continue. At that meeting, we agreed, I agreed, that I would bring this message uh, to the MozFest at the end of October, and so I'll be there, and that um, Mozilla and Wikimedia would bring that message to the CC Summit in Toronto in April. But there are many more events. Open Knowledge Festival is back. RightsCon is coming. 
Copy Camp next year and other events. And so we're interested in taking that conversation forward and hope all of you will carry that as well. Now CC's always been about collaboration and we are trying to use that to change the way that we work and to invite people to be part of our movement. And you're, you may see that if you follow us online, that we're gonna be opening our doors even more to be a, the kind of community that welcomes everyone in and gives them the opportunity to take a leadership role in our work. And I hope that you'll take that opportunity. And if you're interested, I hope you'll speak to me while I'm here. I'm here for the duration. I thank you all for your time. And I look forward to speaking with you over the conference.